This show is called Regeneration Unsettled Settled. And it's a group exhibition, as you might tell from the, the uh, varied offerings. Um, it's a group of nine women who live in the Kansas City area. Some live in, on the Missouri side, some on the Kansas side. And they have a, a group, like sort of like a book club. They have, they're all make, practicing artists and they get together and talk about art and do studio visits and, and try to um, have a, a supportive environment for this group. Um, who, and many of them have known each other for decades. Others are newer members, but, but they get together. Um, they range, and I, I don't want to hit this over the head too hard, but they're a senior group, let's say that much. The youngest is uh, maybe 65, and the oldest is just about to turn 90. So these are women who have, um, some have been practicing artists for decades. Um, a lot of them have had careers as art teachers in both the secondary level and college level and others of them have been arts administrators. So most of them have had a long career with the arts. One was an airline hostess or steward, what do we say now? Um, air, I don't know. Flight attendant. One was a flight attendant for decades, so, um, and she came to art a little later. But the majority have been at this for upwards of 50 years for some of them. It's a varied show. Um, painting, drawing, photography, fiber, there's, and assemblage. So, so really a good diversity of, of um, media. But despite all that, there are some similarities that we could talk about a little bit. And um, then maybe we'll look at each of them individually. Uh, at a, uh, maybe about five years ago or 10 years ago, I posed, I started to think, how am I a, a curator of contemporary art when I'm no longer exactly contemporary? <laughs> so, you know, there are several generations of artists younger than me, some of whom have been at it for a very long time, but we no longer, I no longer share with them the cultural references, societal references, generational references, that make it easy for me to understand what they're doing and, and really to, for me sometimes to understand the impulse behind their work. Um, and that has become a real challenge. But you know, I'm alive and so I'm contemporary and, and so I bring to that moment my experience with art over the past um, 45 years, actually 50 years next next year. So then that includes school. <laughs> That's not where I'm working on it. Um, so the same thing is happening here. I said that they're ranging between 65 and 90 and they're dealing with the contemporary moment and we'll talk about that a little bit. But they are bringing to bear on their art making all the lessons that they learned from the 1960s, 70s, and so forth going forward. And we can talk about a few of those things because that's what really unites this work. Um, the first thing that you might notice as you look around is that, the, that most of the work in here is very surface pattern forward. What did you say? <clears throat> surface pattern forward. That is forward. They're pushing forward the surface pattern. And so what that means is that they're denying spatial depth in the work. There's not a real sense of going in. It's all very much on the surface. Um, they are using, and this, these are lessons that were learned in cubism. So this, this work is by and large very, is, is working with modernist ideas, no matter the medium the flatness of the picture plane, the primacy of that flat surface. There also, you, you'll notice that nothing is really framed. The, the imagery goes to the edges of the canvas as if it could go off the canvas and continue on. This is also a hallmark of modernism, of works that we have in our own permanent collection. The idea that you go off, it's not a contained vista, 
it, it can go off. And almost all of them do that. Even a piece like um, Sharon Hunter Push, where these are obviously derived from old photographs, there is depth of field, there could be a sense of recession. But by choosing this artificial palette, you know, it refers to sepia, memories of old photographs, but she adds this sort of unearthly pink tone to it, and it, push, it pulls everything right to the surface. So even though there's a sense of before and in back of, it really all comes forward and you're much more um, struck by the overall surface patterning. And again, going off the picture plane as if this is just a part of something bigger. There is figuration in some of the work, but again, it's stylized or abstracted. So they're taking figura figural um, elements and either simplifying them or making them a pattern or almost decorative. Um, again, it's, that's not, a, and that's a part of modernism. Uh, most of them are using large areas of flat, unmodulated color. So there's not the sense of roundness or volume. Instead, again, this just reinforces that idea of the flat surface treatment. I said little spatial recession. Um, there's a strong focus on color. And as you look around, some of them share a similar palette. And it's not a palette that you often see. It's an artificial palette. These are not largely colors found in nature. And it's a palette that seems to me to be related to the Rococo period. To people, the, if you think of people like Watteau or Fragonard or Boucher, those those candy box colors. And this is something that, that is repeated in a number of the work. It's not dead, it's not absolutely in every single work, but it's something that a lot of them share. Uh, reduction of detail even in areas that are meant to be represent representative of, of nature, so that you don't see every vein on every leaf in Diana Wirtz's um, series over here, Permian something. Uh, it's been generalized, flattened, and made abstract in that way. <clears throat> and again, I don't want to hit this over the head too hard, but it's, it's sort of the elephant in the room. The generation, uh, the idea of generation in this work. And to me, there is something valedictory in the work. There's a certain sense of looking backwards, of thinking about where life has been and where it is now. I don't know so much about where it's going, but certainly taking the viewpoint of now, but bringing everything that happened. And I think many of us can um, empathize and feel how, how interesting that is. So that reveals its way in, that reveals itself in certain ways. So again, to take Sharon Hunter Push, um, she talks about old family photographs trapped in albums or shoeboxes, or, and she, her job is to seek them out and to put them up on the wall. She wants to, to remember the good old times, and that's what she is doing in her work. So that, that, that's the most obvious way of looking back and bringing something forward. <clears throat> the tapestry on the far wall is by Janet Kummerline, and she is the senior member of the group. Um, she'll be turning 90 next year. She still is doing portrait commissions in graphite, and this is a, but she is best known as a textile artist, a fiber artist, and this is a piece from 1971. So for an artist like that, to have a piece like this in the show, it's something that she was able to do as a younger woman. And at this point, it would probably be physically impossible for her to complete a work like that, as such a monumental undertaking. Um, so there is a, a sense of a retrospective in that regard. <clears throat> uh, Lynn Richardson, the, who was the flight attendant for many years, has traveled all around the world. And in this case, she has done a triptych 
that's titled Notre Dame Burning. So she's referring to the, the horrible fire that um, befell the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris a couple of years back. And in her artist statement, she talks about how important that building was to her, the many visits that she had to Paris, what that building meant to her, and how the destruction of it affected her deeply, and deeply enough to, to do an artwork related to it. So again, it's going back to another time period, bringing it forward into the contemporary. And then Jane Pronko, who is just a master of twilight, and the city scene, I mean, these are so, they're just so charming. And with an economy of means, she is able to get across the time of day and that sense of traffic, but, you know, not highly detailed. It's just enough to get the idea across. Um, I could have chosen other things for her. She is prolific, but um, I like this idea of the twilight and the city scenes. And for an artist like her, who is in her late 80s, nightlife, going out in the evening, is probably something she doesn't do much of anymore. These are almost memories of another time. Mardi Gras figures in the upper right corner of that interior of a kind of a diner. Um, memories, the, the middle bottom is a, a street scene um, in New York City, and the name of the, the store is Memories of New York. So there, this is um, explicit and not so explicit, but you get a sense, again, that she's thinking of another time in her life. I think. I like that idea, anyway. You um, too. A number, so family, in this case, um, memory, in another case, and then several other artists are talking about this moment in time, especially in related, related to climate change, and environmental degradation. So Carol Veshi, in her series of four paintings on the far wall, um, Bless the Pollinators is the series. And each one has a very short title that sort of is related to insects and the noise they make. So there are butterflies that you can suss out in these pictures. There are bees that are even a little bit more easier to pick out. Um, and this is her reference to the, um, the crisis that the pollinators are facing across the country, maybe across the world, and um, how important they are for farming, for just our lives in general. Um, and she's, but she's managed to do this in an abstract way, but also a way that um, I think nature is readily uh, apparent in her work. The titles are Flutter, Rest, Zoom, and buzz, so anamana po, poetic terms. For instance, flutter. What is that one? Zoom. But there's a sense of sound that she captures here in a very artificial way. We have these kind of little yellow jackets up here in the corner, and then there's a dotted line that sort of traces their movement in space, and maybe also the buzz as they go through space. Um, you can see these yellow jackets or, or bumblebees, you know, roughly indicated in a number of the paintings. Um, some of them have more butterfly aspects, like a butterfly wing, and there is a sense here also of that floating quality of, of small butterflies. Where was I going with this? <laughs> Anyway, so I like that idea that she's getting sound, and that's uh, a really, you know, the work of Charles Birchfield. He often incorporated symbols of sound in his landscape paintings, just a a abstract qualities that help to get across the, uh, the sensory of, of being in the outside world. And I think she has that going on in her work. But again, so thinking about the environment, using tools from times past. Um, Diana Wirtz has just moved from the Kansas City area to the Flint Hills in Kansas. Where, uh, and it's a subject that she has turned her attention to for many years and she decided she had to be in the middle of it. Um, and this work is entitled Reflections of the Permian Sea. 
So she's referring to the time when the Flint Hills was covered by water during the Permian era and how that water has given way to prairie and then how the, da the, how the prairie is always endangered of turning into farmland or, or something else. So she has this idea of water shimmering sort of in the background and then various prairie grasses and, and wildflowers um, across it. She thought of these as four individual works, but I like the idea of them as a sort of a series. And it has a little bit of the quality of maybe a, a Monet water lily type thing where you can become immersed in a, in a scene as it goes across. Um, Carol Zastupil is kind of the, uh, an unusual artist. She's interested in the work of a, a regionalist like Grant Wood, an artist from the 1920s and 30s and 40s. Um, and if you think of some of his landscapes, he typically did these stylized rolling hills with a road winding its way. There's in fact a, a, a one just like that, a road winding its way through these rolling hills. So she's looking at an artist like that. Also Reginald Marsh, another really regionalist artist. And then um, David Hockney. And David Hockney might account for that palette, which is very singular. Um, some of them are using candy box colors, but she's taken it to do you remember that old game, Candyland? That's, that's what I thought of. It's like Candyland here. Um, so it's fanciful. Um, it makes art historical references. Uh, it's, I th it's certainly unique. Um, in her more recent works, which are along the top row, there is some spatial recession in her work. You know, she fights between two-dimensionality two and and that road winding into space. But, um, it, but it always seems to come forward. But in that, especially the two on the upper left, and she thinks of these as diptychs, so that the two together are meant to be a pair. Um, the two in the upper left are more recent, and she's really flattened that space and pulled everything forward. The reference to landscape is becoming less and less apparent. And, um, she fills her um, compositional forms with the series of abstract patterning and it's certainly evident down below and what's going on down there. Kind of look almost like a, an airplane going over a landscape and you get the checkerboard effect of various planted fields. But that changes in those upper, the upper two on the left where everything becomes very forward and upright. It blocks any kind of sense of going in um, and it makes me think of the work of an artist like Gustav Klimt. If you think back to um, the late 19th century and um, his work in Vienna. Um, you know, if, do you know the painting? Of Who did you say? Gustav Klimt. Klimt, Klimt. yeah. If, do you know the, the piece, the lovers, the men, they're kind of kneeling and they're cloaked in this sumptuous fabrics? Well, she's, I think she's picking up on that thing. And I think it has to do with mosaic. There's a mosaic quality to this. Um, but I always thought of Gustav Klimt as a sort of a decorative painter, but he's also thought of as a very early modernist because of the way that he spread that pattern out across the picture plane the way he flattened his spaces, the stylization of recognizable form, and she has some of that going on. The same thing with Catherine Vesci. I, I asked her if she knew about the McDonald sisters from Glasgow, Scotland, um, who were part of kind of the arts and crafts movement in Scotland with Charles Rene Mackintosh. And she didn't know it, but if you look them up, you'll, especially that first one, it's very, it's interesting how motifs come out um, over time. One of the reasons that I, cho I agreed to do this exhibition was because three of the artists in the show are in our permanent collection already. Um, Janet Kummerlein, we have two pieces by her. Uh, Jane Pronko, we have a, a very nice uh, city street scene by her of the Central Park West. 
and Catherine Vesci, we have a, a smaller work by her of um, a woodland scene with a finch incorrectly placed on the ground. But this is like a tour de force of the medium. Of, of all the artists in this group, Janet probably had the most complete career. Um, she was included in a groundbreaking exhibition called Objects USA that was organized by the Smithsonian in 1968. And what it did was it really gave a boost to the studio craft movement in the United States. The exhibition toured the country and it was also an international um, exhibition. And Janet was one of the artists included in that. So back in, with a fiber piece. So from that time forward, she's really been a leader in fiber art and, and really um, architectural fiber pieces. She works with corporations and, and public spaces, uh, oftentimes uh, churches. This originally was um, installed in a, I think it was in a bank, and it was up to the ceiling, and the ceiling was mirrored so that when you stood in front of it, it would create a, a kind of a circle that overarched. It was originally scheduled to be on view in summer of 2020 and it was going to be downstairs. It was going to be one of our summer shows and we were going to be able to divide the nine artists up a little more clearly by doing it downstairs where there were all those little separate areas. Um, but of course we were not doing shows last year so they all hung on and I was not able to do much in the way of exhibition organization last year by going outside of our own collection. So I knew this show was, was on tap and they were ready and so we moved it in to be the featured show for the fall of 2021 and then we were able to use it also for the Missouri Arts Council grant for, for this year. So it worked out very neatly. Um, but I was concerned about how to get nine artists in here and to make sure that everyone had their space and th that it looked good at the same time. So we had just had the rule of three and um, I loved that show so much as it turned out. And, and so what it did was divide the space up into nine points, at, at least taped off all those spots. So this is basically the same layout as the rule of three, but it worked to give them and then by, by hanging in a salon style and double hanging and stacking, um, it was able to fill the space, but er and then every artist had their own discrete area. Yeah, so it, 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 I'm happy with the way it worked out. Okay, so, and then we have Donna Bachman. <clears throat> Donna. And she has been an art teacher for years in, at the college level. Um, I think she continues to, to teach. And she has kind of two bodies of work here. The first is referred to as the American Suite, this red, white, and blue assemblage. Um, so assemblage, again, is a 20th century, early 20th century phenomenon. And she's revisiting it. She is not changing it, but she is um, adding to the, its rich history. Uh, red, white, and blue, so obviously it refers to the flag and, that, and America and that sort of thing. And each one has a different feel to it. The first one is called Little Hands. And um, these were made with a 3D printer. I don't know what that means exactly, but... It's creepy. <laughs> <coughs> but um, of all the artists, this she is the only one who has a strong political point of view, at least in this first um, example. So we have chess pieces down here, pawns. We have a sense of a checkerboard at, in the red background. And then these hands reaching through, little hands reaching through a chain link fence. And so I think it's not a hard leap to get to the border crisis and when uh, the children were being separated from their parents. <laughs> Hands. Oh. Yes, and yes, exactly. So that is that one piece. This, the second one is called Pilgrimages, and um, the, the uh, scallop shell has traditionally been used as a symbol of the pilgrim 
going back to the time of um, pilgrims going to Santiago de Compostela and St. James, whose symbol is the, cockle, the scallop shell. And pilgrims would wear little badges of, that were in the shape of scallops when they were on their pilgrimages. Um, but using found objects here, all kinds of, first the shells themselves, but cookie cutters and various flotsam and jetsam, she puts them together and like all assemblage, you take something that had a life before you and had meaning before you and you put it together with other objects and it takes on new meaning and new purpose. And in a poetic way, you're taking two dissimilar things, putting them together and making a new whole. And then this one, I like this one pretty well. Um, with various collections of, of glassware. It reminds me of my early days in flea, flea markets. I, I would have gotten this in a, middle, in a minute. I think that's blown, a blown glass stopper for a decanter. I don't care you didn't have the bottom. That, I like that. Oh, maybe, it, no, that's what it is. I thought it might be a sock darner, but it, I think it's a decanter. Anyway, so, you know, lustrous, light catching, um, I'm not sure what the meaning here. You know, they all have this sort of sinister. Sinister. Thank you. Um, the chain, the edge of the saw, and barbed wire. So that is running through. Um, I'm not sure how it relates in in all cases. This one I think is the easiest to decipher. Um, this one, these two, not so not so much. What, Tom, what's the title of that blue? Star chart, star chart. So there, you know, I think that has to do with the the reflection and the the light through glass and the dark sky. So it's almost like constellations you're looking up. Well, and on the flag, because we're talking about red, white, and blue. Yeah. Blue oh. Field has yes. Yeah. That's a good point. Can you say that again? The red stripes and the. On the flag. You've got a red, white, blue, and the blue field has stars on it. Uh -huh. Or maybe even traveling at night and following the stars. That's Pilgrims. Like, like night traveling and looking at the stars. Yeah. And even migrants are traveling at night. I was thinking of the Holocaust with the barbed wire. Yeah. And all they had was looking up. Well, that's a big deal. Yeah. Then these um, box, these boxes, they're called Secret Gardens. The series is the Secret Gardens. We have Digital Jungle, Dangerous Terrain, Desert Floor, and the Burnt House. What is this one called? The Burnt House. So it's assemblage, and we've certainly seen boxes throughout the years. Think of Joseph Cornell comes right away to mind. Um, but she's also kind of combining it with a, with a more recent phenomenon of light art. And if you think of someone like James Turrell, who does these, these uh, installations where you sort of see through a wall into a field of light, she, I think, is echoing some of, the, um, of, of that kind of aspect. Again, this is a 3D printed piece, so it, it employs computer technology. Um, this one is filled with broken glass and bullets and fish hooks. There were, there were explicit instructions on how to touch this piece. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> uh, that one is covered in broken glass. Around the frame. Around the frame, okay. yes. Okay. I was looking inside. No, and the insides of all of them are very plain, and, okay. and it's just this light. And basically, it's complementary contrast, well, or p p partially. So you have green and kind of a purpley pink. You have red and green, I think yellow and purple, and then black and white. How, is, is there a light source in there? How is it lit? It, there is this, there's a, like a strip which has little LED buttons in there. You know, they make these things so small now. And, but, the, the, but the thing is, there is a battery pack in there. So you have to switch it on and off. 
it's a little um, scary because yeah. we don't. Once it's up on the wall, we don't really want to touch it again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any um, questions or comments about this room? Wonderful. Love it. Love it. Love it. I do. Oh. I to this piece here. It also reminds me of Hopper's work. Edward Hopper. Yeah, like Midnight Hopper. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there, there's a sense of a person looking and not really being engaged. So these people are all kind of on their own. They're not engaging with the artist. So there's that distance and that sense of a lot people alone in the city, I guess. And silent. You know, there are all those cars, but it feels silent as well. Okay, let's go. What? Photographs. Did she paint over it? I don't know what her technique is. You know, we were talking about that. There, it's very broadly painted. So she either could have, you know, she could have used an overhead light projector and taken the photograph and just projected up. Or you can grid, you can grid the original and then grid your canvas and reproduce it that way. Or she may have just painted. I don't, I'm not sure. I, I'll ask her today when she oh, comes. I don't, I don't know, but they're very, it's broad, they, they tighten up, but when you get up close, it's very broad. This is, this is real loose. It's very loose. So I'm, I'm interested to know how she, is she freehand, I mean, it could, she could be just freehanding it, who knows, I don't know.